Hey everyone, it's Nurse Mike here from SimpleNursing.com. Today we're going to be talking all about respiratory drugs, and in particular, bronchodilators. But before we get started, for all my Simple Nursing members, you're going to want to pull up these two study guides located in your membership to follow along throughout this video. Now for lower respiratory drugs, we have two teams, the BAM team and the SLAM team. So BAM is for our bronchodilators that act to dilate the bronchi in the lungs. And SLAM is our anti-inflammatory agents to soothe the inflammation. So guys, let's start with our bronco team, BAM. First off, we have B for beta-2 agonists. These guys end in butyrol, like L-butyrol and levalbutyrol. So guys, just remember the B in butyrol is used for brutal asthma attacks. Since it's the first drug we use during severe asthma attacks, and it's the fastest acting bronchodilator. So the NCLEX keyword here is, it's the only rescue inhaler during acute asthma attacks to be used before steroid inhalers. That's always a common NCLEX question. Now guys, big caution here. Selimetrol is a beta-2 agonist as well, but it's a slower acting, not a rescue inhaler. So not to be used during an acute asthma attack since it ends in terol and not buterol. Now it's used commonly with a combination of steroids for a longer term control of moderate to severe asthma. Now a common NCLEX question is do not use fluticasone or selimetrol for the first signs of acute asthma attack. So during acute asthma attacks, guys, we give three drugs. And to be honest, sequence is key on the NCLEX. So use the memory trick AIM for the acute asthma attack. A for albuterol, which is always used first during brutal asthma and not selimetrol, which is the slower acting one. I is for ipratropium, always use second, which we'll be covering next. And M is for methylprednisolone. Brand name, Sullimetrol, which is our steroid, always to be used last since steroids act so slow. And it has the word prednisolone, which kind of sounds like prednisone. So that's how you know it's a steroid. Now for the mechanism of action, these are beta-2 agonists, which activate beta-2 in the lungs, which dilates the bronchi, resulting in increased airflow. But it also activates beta-1 in the heart, which makes the heart go crazy fast. So the common side effect is a rapid heart rate. So just think albuterol amps up the body. Now expected side effects for albuterol. Just think of the three T's. T for tachycardia and palpitations, T for tremor, and T for tossing and turning at night. Keyword for exams are insomnia and difficulty sleeping. So teach patients not to take it at bedtime. And guys, don't let the NCLEX trick you. Commonly chosen distractors not constipation, that's a side effect for opioid pain meds, and not hives, that's totally an allergic reaction, not expected finding. Now patient education, a little side note for asthmatic patients. We always avoid beta blockers that end in LOL, like atenolol, which can cause bronchospasms. And avoid NSAIDs like naproxen and ibuprofen, which can worsen asthma. Now during an attack or a severe asthma attack, we instruct patients to take two to four puffs every 20 minutes for three rounds. Now, the big key point here, guys, write this down. If it doesn't work after three doses, then you notify the HCP. And how do we evaluate if the med is effective? Well, we have decrease in respiratory rate. Example, 34 respirations go down to 24. And guys, the oxygen saturation is at least 90% or higher. Now, a common HESI question asks about albuterol nebulizer, some expected findings after treatment. Well, there's going to be increased productive cough, reports of decreased anxiety, as well as mild bilateral hand tremors, guys. These are totally normal. Now, as far as administration, make sure you shake it before you take it. So remember, come on, shake, shake it. Come, come on, shake, shake it. <laughs> now, guys, the key point here is always make sure to shake it well. Then you breathe all the way out, push the inhaler, inhale and hold for a few seconds, then exhale. Now, if we're taking with steroids too, 
The correct order is albuterol first to bronchodilate and open the lungs, and steroids second to get all that powder down into the deep lungs. Now, as far as cleaning the meter-dosed inhaler, we always clean the mouthpiece one to two times per week with warm water. Now, this does not have to be done after every use. Common NCLEX question. Only steroids are washed after every use, so guys just think steroid inhalers go right in the sink after each use. Now, a common question on exit exams. They'll present a patient with severe asthma with their vital signs all screwed up. And they'll ask, which medication would you give? Select all that apply. So guys, remember, during asthma attacks, we give AIM, albuterol, ipratropium, and methylpredazolone. So guys, our correct options here are two for albuterol inhaler, three nebulizer ipratropium, and five IV methylpredazolone. If you want more tips and tricks on common respiratory drug questions, like the one we just walked through, well, our Simple Nursing membership has exit prep lectures and thousands of questions written by current professors and NCLEX writers. Now our next drug is A for anticholinergics, ending in tropium like ipratropium or teotropium. Now these guys dry the body out. So think tropium, you can't pee with them with your peums. Used for moderate to severe asthma and COPD. It's a longer acting bronchodilator that reduces secretions and commonly given in combination with albuterol. Now they're used second in line during a severe or acute asthma attack. Remember our acronym AIM. A for albuterol first, ipratropium second, and methylprednisolone third, guys. That is our brand name, Sulimetrol. Always our steroids are given last since steroids act slow. Now the mechanism of action is that it blocks secretion, so you can't see, pee, spit, or sh poop. Now this is called anticholinergic effects. And I remember by saying anticholinergic or antisecretions, since they block acetylcholine. And again, you can simply say tropium means you can't pee with them. So the obvious side effect is dry mouth and hoarseness. And we teach patients these key points. To treat the dry mouth and throat for all anticholinergics, we use gum and candy, and we also drink fluids. Now the big key point here, and the big test tip is, no swallowing teotropium capsules, guys. Put the capsule inside the inhaler device, and then inhale. Never swallow the pill. This came up on both the HESI and ATI exams. Now, a big contraindication to all anticholinergics. We never give for patients who are already dry. So those who can't see, like with glycoma, those who can't pee, like with urinary retention and BPH, and those who can't spit or sh poop, like with bowel obstructions. Our last bronchodilator, M4 methoxanthines, ending in fillin, like theophylline or aminophilin. It's kind of like giving caffeine that makes your heart race and can be very toxic. So think fillin has you fillin caffeinated and toxic with a super rapid heart rate. Now the key points are the three T's. T for toxicity over 20. Now that's the biggest NCLEX tip there. Theophylline has a very narrow therapeutic range between 10 and 20. So we constantly need frequent blood draws. Now the next T is for tonic-clonic seizures. That's the number one sign for severe toxicity and always the first priority as a nurse. So guys, we report signs and symptoms of toxicity like anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and even restlessness and insomnia. Now the last T is for tachycardia and dysrhythmias, a big NCLEX tip right there. Now these are common adverse effects of the drug, but two common test questions on the HESI were to teach patients to avoid beta blockers that lower the heart rate, which can also block the effects of theophylline, and also to alert the HCP of tachycardia before administering the next dose. Now, patient education, the two drugs that increase toxicity risk, and big NCLEX tip again, is cimetidine, the H2 blocker given for heartburn, and also ciproflaxin, the antibiotic. And guys, always teach the patients to take in the AM since you get amped up in the AM and avoid caffeine. Technically, avoid all stimulants. 
And lastly, we stop before a cardiac stress test, which can augment the test. Now, three common questions. Which of the following prescription should the nurse question? So number one, naproxen for asthmatic patients. Yes, guys, we always question this one. Never NSAIDs or beta blockers for patients with asthma. How about number two, ipratropium for a patient with glycoma? No, we never do tropriums for a patient who can't see, spit, or sh poop. You get the idea. Now, option number three, low sartan for a patient with diabetes. Oh, well, yeah, that's okay. How about option number four, theophylline for a patient taking cimetidine? Well, guys, we're going to question this order because it increases the risk for toxicity. Always cimetidine and ciproflaxin. And number five, atenolol for a patient with asthma. Yes, guys, always question this one. Never give beta blockers to asthmatic patients. Now, question number two, what patient teaching should be included with a new prescription of albuterol, ibuprofen, teotropium, and beclomethazone? Select all that apply. Now, option number one, tinnitus is an expected side effect. No, guys, tinnitus is a serious side effect. Basically tells us that the drug is hard on the kidneys, usually caused by antibiotics here. Now, option number two here, tachycardia is expected after albuterol. Yes, guys, the T's of albuterol. One of them is tachycardia. Totally normal. Option three, report dark stool to the provider. Yes, guys, NSAIDs like ibuprofen can cause GI bleeding. So we report dark tarry stools. Now, option number four, drink fluids to prevent dry mouth and throat. Yes, guys, tropiums dry the mouth so we can't pee with them with tropium. So we get urinary retention as well as dry mouth. And last thing, guys, is five, ipratropium is used first during an attack. No, we always use buterols for brutal asthma, commonly albuterol. Now, last question, which medication prescribed for asthma causes tachycardia and dysrhythmias? Option number one, phenobarbital. No, guys, this is a sedative for anxiety. Option number two is the correct one, aminophilin. Guys, remember, fillins have you fill in caffeinated and amped up. Now, the last two options, salmetrol and albuterol, technically both can cause tachycardia, but usually don't cause dysrhythmias. So we have to throw that out here. Thanks for watching. Did you know you can unlock beautifully handcrafted study guides packed with key points and memory tricks from all our videos? Plus, you'll get access to over 1,200 exclusive videos not on YouTube, all neatly organized by Nursing School Topic to make that complex nursing knowledge actually stick. You'll also gain thousands of practice questions written by current professors and actual NCLEX writers. So for access to all this and more, click right up here or visit simplenursing.com. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Happy studying, and we'll see you in the next videos.